Hello everyone, today Exo and I are going to introduce a type of attack called Tocto. Before we go straight into details of the Tocto attack, let's first take a look at the concept behind it, which is called a race condition. A race condition occurs in a multi-threaded program that have multiple threads reading and writing the same resource at the same time. In reality, multi-threaded program can often be seen in a web server or data intensive application. However, if the threat safety is not guaranteed, some type of computation might cause a race between multiple threads and corrupt the shared resource. For example, let's take a look at the code below. In the main function, we create two threads that share the same global variable x, and in the function increase 1, each thread first checks the value of x and adds 1 to it if x is 0. When the two increments are executing sequentially, the result will always be 1. However, since we do not have any thread save mechanism to protect the shared resource x, sometimes we could get a 2 out of it. Because it might happen that the two threads both check the value of x at the same time, which is 0, and then both add 1 to it. In this case, the value will be 2. After we briefly introduce the concept of race condition, you might be wondering how can we use this kind of technique to exploit some vulnerable code. Actually, the exploit method is just like the previous example. However, in this case, the vulnerability within the program is not because the program is multi-threaded and contains some race condition itself, but instead we run two processes concurrently and exploit the time difference between the check time and the use time of the resource in the vulnerable program. For example, if we want to write a file in a Unix system, we would often write something like this. However, this code is not safe because the access and write is not running atomically. Therefore, it's possible that the file it checks in the access method is no longer the file it writes into later. The behavior can be achieved if we could run another program concurrently to create a symbolic link in the same directory and it links to a file with writing permission and then switch it back after the exit. This type of attack um, often won't succeed at the first time because it requires perfect timing between those two threads or process. However, you can run it infinitely many times until that timing occurs. In the demo afterwards, Axel will show you a simple example of this kind of exploitation in the context of a Unix file system of our race condition, we will look at a program that is written C because uh, everyone is taking or has taken CS450 and is familiar with the function that are using it. So this program here is just a program that takes a file as an argument and checks if the user has access to that file and then writes what is in standard input to the file. And here you can notice that we added a delay uh, just to simulate the delay, but in a real life situation, this delay might be any operation that takes a long time. For example, it could be fetching from a database or something. So this file, if ran on its own, uh, is really just an innocuous file that writes uh, to another file and it won't have any problem. But an evil user may exploit this file using another C file. For example, in our case, we wrote another symbolic link file, and this program creates a symbolic link to a file called password. Now, just a reminder, a symbolic link is just a file that points another file. So it's like a pointer, but for a file. Notice that here, we are making the argv1 file point to the password file when we call symlink. And the password file is a file that is owned by the root. So we can see the content, here it is, but I cannot write to it. If I try to write to it, I will get an error saying that I don't have permission. But what I can do is that I can create another file called temp. And since I created the file, I know that I can write, read, and do anything on it. Now using this temp file and the two programs that I have shown before, and using the race condition issue, we will be able to write to the password file. If I call both programs simultaneously and I pass in temp as an argument, 
I do not know which program and which functions are going to be called first because they're ran simultaneously. So among all the different possibilities, there's one possibility which will allow us to write to the password file. That is, if we are able to reach the access function call right here first, then it will check if we have access to file name, and in our case, file name is temp. But we know that we have access to temp because we just created the file before. This means that we will go into the if condition right here. And if before the f open here, the other program calls symlink first, then temp will be pointing to password. This means that when we call f open here, we're actually going to be opening password because temp is now pointing to password. And since password is open, we can write and do anything we want to it. But because the f open has been called after the access, and here the file was still temp, we won't get any error or anything. So as a recap, if we are calling first access and then symlink, and then f open in this order, we will be able to write to password. However, notice that the for loop right here is what makes it possible because if we didn't have a delay between access and f open, it will be almost impossible to have symlink be called right in between these two function calls. So this bash script will repeatedly run the two programs simultaneously and passing in temp as an argument until it sees that the password file has been modified. So it checks that by doing ls and checking the length of the password file. And now we can run this bash script. And you can see that the first two times it failed because it didn't run the functions the way we wanted it to run in this order we wanted, so we didn't get permission. But at the third time, it worked. And then if we look at the password file right now, we can see that we added a line saying attack success right here. Due to time constraints, we just showed how to write to random file protected by the root. But for an actual attack, we could try to write to the actual Linux password file. And we could, for example, add in a new line specifying a new user and providing it root privileges. And then once the new user gets root privileges, you can then use this user to just do whatever you want. After we have seen the demo, it's easy to realize that this type of vulnerability actually occurs very often. Because the only condition is that the program checks and uses the same resource at a different time. Therefore, you might be wondering how can we defend this kind of attack. The easiest way to defend this is to set O no follow flag in the open system call to prevent the open function from following the symbolic link. Another way around this is to check the UID of the symbolic link and the file it links to. The open only follows when the two UIDs match. However, those two methods require us to change the source of the program when this occurs, which is not very practical. The symbolic link risk exploitation happens quite often and it already has 438 CVE entries online. However, in reality, it's very hard to eliminate and avoid. A possible solution proposed in the research committee is for Unix system to adopt transactions in the file system or the OS kernel. However, no production Unix kernel has yet adopted transactions. Alright, that's all for today. Thanks for watching. Bye.